Coaches, welcome. Welcome to the live hangout uh, from Basketball Immersion with uh, Gannon Baker. And uh, Gannon, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, it's an honor to be here, Chris. You know, um, you know, anytime you can get with people that have the same passion and vision as you, and, you know, I, I, I think everybody on this platform loves basketball and loves life. So uh, I always believe iron sharpens iron, and I hope some people ha out there have some iron because I'm ready to get sharpened. <laughs> That's great. This is meant to be interactive, meaning you're meant to ask the questions on the podcast, uh, which I thought we did a great podcast together with uh, lots of stimulating conversation. I ask questions, but for this, I'd love for you to be the active participant in your learning and ask the questions that you want answers for. And, uh, you know, uh, the situation definitely, uh, again, we talked about a little bit before we get on has uh, disrupted everyone. And I know you have some very good actionable ideas for people to be able to coach yeah. their players uh, when you can't have access to them face to face. Do you want to share a few of those? And then we'll share your email so they can email you for the full document as well. Yeah, you know, uh, this is not the first time that, you know, any of us have been in uh, uncertain and, and crazy times. I mean, if you're a coach, uh, you're going to have many crazy, uncertain times during the season. The nature of, of a coach, the nature of, 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 a, uh, of a leader is you're going to go through battles. I mean, any time you set a goal, set a victory, you want to get the most out of life, you have to prepare for, for battles. And that, that's all this is. This didn't shock me. This just shouldn't affect our energy, our passion, our, our wisdom. Uh, but it is uncomfortable. And, and I think you can either be comfortable or you can be great, but you can't be both. So, you know, this, this is what, as crazy as it sounds, this is what life needed. This is what we needed. And so I look at, I look at, at, at this, you know, uh, great coaches, great players, the great players that I've been able to work out and be around. <clears throat> when they have adversity, they adapt, they find solutions, and then they work till they win. I mean, that's it. That, that's, that's Mamba mentality, man. You adapt, you, you, you find solutions, and then you work till you, till you win. So, you know, what I've done in the last few days is just jot down things that players can do during this time and, and then coaches can do to empower their players, to, to educate, to empower, to, uh, you know, inspire their players to not be passive, right, but be, but be productive. You know, not be uh, sitting in a, in a position of laziness, but to be passionate about, all right, use this time to get better. And I, I think a, a, a total coach is a coach that, you know, coaches their players physically. Like physically, what can their players do? Mentally, you know, what tools can you give your players to add to their toolbox? Emotionally, you know, that's a buzzword, but, I mean, QB Brown was coaching it back in the 70s and 80s. So was John Chaney, a coach that I had a chance to play against at Temple when I was at Duquesne. Emotional intelligence, right? You got to find a way now to help our players with emotions. And then, you know, uh, whether you believe in God or not, the spiritual side, right? Their soul, uh, their soul gives them peace. Their soul takes away that stress that these young players feel. I mean, we got to talk about it. Depression is, is really attacking uh, not only athletes, but everybody. And uh, I didn't know this. I watched the documentary last night uh, on Tyson uh, Fury, the, the boxer, right? I didn't know he was depressed most of his career. So uh, Michael Phelps, I found out recently. So, you know, it, it affects everybody. Everybody, every NBA team, WNBA team has hired a sports psychologist. So it's all relative. Whatever the best of the best do, you know, we got to go all the way down to our middle school team and say, you know what? You know, let's self-check these guys' souls, these girls' uh, spirits, you know. And, and as a coach, you know, we're not professionals, sports psychologists, but I think if we do our due diligence and do our very best, we can help in some way in that, that spiritual side. But anyway, I, that, that's, what I've, uh, that's what I've done professionally is just right. write down, uh, probably over 100 thoughts in a document of how coaches and players can use this as a productive time. It's a tremendous document, and uh, I'm going to make sure we'll get you to include the email uh, so coaches can email you and get this document at the end of it. But uh, uh, Coach, Coach Hugo starts with the first question for you from our, from our audience, and that's, what do you think is the most undertaught skill? 
uh, team skill or uh, let's individual? Say individual let's say individual skill. But I'll ask Hugo for clarification. You can type it in. Uh, yes, yeah, Hugo, great question. Uh, I, I've even made this mistake at times. Uh, passing the ball, you know, driving, catching, and if I don't shoot, where's the next play? Where's the next pass? Making decisions, right, to pass the ball to a teammate who has a better shot, right, on the dribble, passing on the catch or in the triple threat, passing on the finish with a pivot, right? Those are the three times that you're going to catch it, and if you draw two or your defender stops you, um, and then coupled with that, and again, I didn't do a great job of teaching this until later on in my uh, experience is in an individual workout, whether you have one player, two players, three players, really emphasizing to the player, hey, let's make a decision, whatever it is, make a decision in two seconds. You know, the Spurs have the 1.9 rule. Uh, I went to Carolina basketball school. I don't know if people remember this name, Dean Smith. You know, uh, he made us a pick. Yeah, yeah, pretty good name. He, he actually offered me a chance to walk on. I uh, could have walked on at Carolina, but I didn't want to sit the bench. So, uh, or at least at first sit the bench. I don't know. But um, I remember at his camps and, and he did some workouts with us uh, for the top players. He made us make a decision in three seconds. And his thing was 1,001, 1,002. What the hell are you going to do? And so as a player, you know, you have – as a coach, you got to emphasize to your players to make a decision in two seconds to get your workouts where they make an either-or decision. Do I pass to this guy or this guy? Do I pass to this girl or shoot the basketball? So that's what I think is the most underdeveloped uh, skill taught because as a coach, it's not what you do. It's what you emphasize. You know, John Wood, you know, you know a lot, but what are you emphasizing? And what are your non-negotiables? What are your eyes looking at during that workout? Great stuff. And uh, Coach Christopher asks, what are some of the biggest differences between doing skills training for amateur players versus NBA players? Great question. If, if you would watch Kobe work out, uh, and I, I've actually had a chance to go on the court with him, and if you watch Ray Allen work out, I've actually worked out with them. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, they do, I mean, tongue in cheek, right? A lot of their drills, an eighth grader would be doing. Uh, it, they're very fundamental. They're very simplistic. Uh, Alan Stein wrote a great book. He had a great sound bite. He asked Kobe, you know, Kobe, you, you did basic fundamental stuff in your workouts. He, and Kobe responded, why do you think I'm the best in the world? Because I do I have simplicity and consistency. And, and simplistic drills. So that, that's one thing. A lot of the drills, I mean, honestly, the fundamentals, you know, the, a lot of players can do. However, what's, what's different is the consistency, the productivity. You know, you'll get a Damian Lillard to make 50 three-pointers in a row from the corner where, you know, how many players can do that? Steph Curry, you know, make 300 free throws in a row. So the, the productivity and the you know, the talent of the players doing the drills is much different. A and the attitude, you know, they're locked in. They don't get distracted. They don't get bored. Um, they don't, you don't, as a coach, you know, you don't have to coach their motor or their passion. With younger players, you know, I mean, you just think about the nature of a 13-year-old to a 25-year-old. They're at the height of their ignorance, and their nature is to be inconsistent. You know, it it's the nature of, of kids to be inconsistent and to be not as ignorant uh, when they're teenagers. So that, that's, that's what you got to expect. And that's what you got to have the tools as a coach to notice and, 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 uh, and respond to that. But that, but that's a good question. I hope I answered it clearly. That's great. And, uh, Co coach Allen, can you share any experience on coaching international, uh, school, high school boys teams? If you have encountered any of such coaching teams in such teams, that are uh, not really great talent so he's just asking about the experience of coaching some of the international players which you have great experience because you're the man in china yeah <laughs> I, i've been blessed to uh i think i'm right now at 48 countries 
that I've been to and been able to most of them coach their junior national players to their grassroots players. I think I'm going to Belize, where, wherever that is, uh, in June. <laughs> is that a country? Belize? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. You'll love oh, it. You've been there. Okay. Oh, yeah. well, you, can, you can give me the intel on their players, but I'm just looking forward to the beaches. Actually, I get one well, day. That's what I've been there for, too. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you know, my opinion on international players is they, they embrace the culture of education. They understand the behavior of a coach. They know that if, if they have a practice, it's the nature, like they, they're soldiers, so to speak. They, they come early, they stretch, they're prepared. You're the teacher, so they honor you. It's part of their culture. They honor authority and education. So they give you eye contact, they listen, they acknowledge they're present. In the States, the, you know, the first week, the first day, you know, you got to set culture. You got to tell them, no, no, eye contact. Hey, you come early. Hey, get a sweat before the workout. Pay attention. Shoulders back. Like, you know, you, 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 so you don't have to set culture to learn uh, internationally. Now, China is not as they're, they're probably some of the worst players I've trained, but they understand education. They respect education. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's like PE class in school. You know, you go through all these subjects and you get to PE and you're fired up. That's the way they always are in basketball. I don't care whether it's the last day of practice or the first day, they have the same motor. Um, and, and, and then in Europe, you know, the fundamentals are natural. Like you'll, you'll have, uh, 11 year olds, but you can give them an advanced curriculum as far as fundamentals there there's because they've been training the right way since they were eight years old. Uh, China, you know, which I've been in for the last 11 years and the last three years a lot. Um, it's, it's ambiguous. I can't understand. Like I, I, it's, that's a whole nother podcast. It's all over the place. Um, so <laughs> they, they, they really don't understand it, even at the highest level what it means to develop champions and, and, you know, their track records speak for themselves. Uh, the biggest weakness of, of Europe is, is a lot of the, even the pros, uh, a lot of the pros I've dealt with with pre-draft is uh, they don't deal with pressure. Well, when they face adversity, they get intimidated. Um, they don't, they're not as strong. Uh, for, I don't, I don't know the reason, but they're not physically uh, as strong and they don't have that endurance right away. Uh, don't know the reason for that, but but that, that's the biggest weakness is they don't deal with stress and they don't de they don't have uh, good strength endurance. Coach Brandon kind of asked a similar question, which is the difference between Euro and American players. Kind of answered that. So, Brandon, if you want to rephrase maybe more specifically, I can address it too. But uh, uh, next one, that, what, what are the best fundamental drill skills you would recommend for younger high school players to work on? And how often should a high school player work out weekly outside of his or her team? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know if people know, but I have a full uh, comprehensive, comprehensive curriculum that, you know, uh, is broken down cumulatively for beginner all the way up to pro. And it shows you uh, for every skill. There's nothing that we didn't cover exactly uh, what to do as an eight-year-old, what to do as a high school um, but I think uh, high school players need during the off season, during the season, well, really during the off season, you need to turn your weaknesses into strengths, and you need to enhance your strengths. During the season, you just need to enhance your strengths, and if you have time, you know, work on your weaknesses. But bottom line is, number one, you got to teach high school kids how to create separation going downhill, which means driving, and then if they can do that, uphill which means east-west to the wing, uh, back dribble, uh, and then uh, obviously a move and a counter. So move and a counter with the dribble going to the rim and a move and a counter going away from the uh, rim. Sometimes it's with a teammate, which, which is called a dribble handoff. You need to teach them how to uh, – now this is, a, this is debatable, but for me, I like kids in high school to be able to have a runner, which is a, a shot off one foot because you get it off quicker and you get more uh, arc. A lot of high school coaches say, no, nah, I like my players to play off too. That's fine. That, that's cool. But I'm telling you, as undersized players that are a little bit slow, you know, if, if, they, if they want to, if they have the will, you know, give them the skill. But they got to have a runner. 
which is a hook, and then obviously uh, a, um, a counter off that runner, which is a euro step, okay? And then uh, a, a move and a counter off two feet finish. Um, probably the big one of the biggest weaknesses outside of passing and making decisions is shooting. You know, do your players justice. If you're allowed to work with them, you know, take, you know, 24 hours, break it up into a couple weeks, but spend two hours with each kid on your team and try to teach them the right way how to shoot. Again, our curriculum can teach you. I got drills from Ray Allen that are incredible, uh, along with my own shooting work workout because I taught myself how to shoot with both hands. So I really believe in my shooting drills. But bottom line is, man, you got to teach these kids how to shoot properly because that's an underlying skill. And if a kid can shoot and has a good attitude, and he's going to get playing time on any level, I promise you. Um, so that's something that, that you got to teach kids. And then, as I said, um, you know, you really want to teach them how to, how to play off a pass and how to make decisions. So once they do all that individually, you know, the next most important thing is teach them how to play with a teammate, get another teammate in there, or you get in there and be involved. And so now you're working on driving kicks. Now you're working on coming off pin downs or down screens. And if it's part of your system, you know, ball screens. So feeding the post moving without the ball, spacing and respacing, all that you can uh, achieve in 2 on 3 on workouts. So I hope I answered your question clearly. Do you use a certain, Coach Josh asked, do you use a certain go-to warm-up for your workout? Yeah, 100%. Uh, my go-to warm-up is jump roping and stationary ball handling with one ball, uh, two balls, and then a tennis ball. Yes, 100%. Players love it, never gets old never gets boring uh you, you you generate some intensity right away you get a sweat so now we we uh we go stretch and here's something that, that I, I like doing and players enjoy this during their rest time so you say you do a drill for 30 seconds during their rest time go right to the rim and do form shooting or form uh finishing so if it's a if it's a runner we're working on that last step. You know, it, it's not intense. They get their heart rate down, but they're also working on technique and they're building those, uh, uh, you know, the, that skill technique they need for that move. Great. That's a great question. Do you, um, do you have some specific ideas? You talked about the importance of passing decision-making for developing those in uh, your workout, some passing things. Yeah, so with decision making, um, I always like to use flesh to keep it fresh. My my friend Cody Topper, who I, I think, uh, great guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he says bones over cones. So, um, you know, as a coach, you can you can uh, manipulate a close out. So you can close out. You can guard them. Uh, they can go past the chair, and then you're behind the chair, and you can jump out. Uh, on a side ball screen, they're coming off a chair. You're the defender, right? The chair's the ball screener. You're the defender of the chair, which is the ball screener. You can give them a hard show, a soft show, a separated show, a jam, an ice, a switch, uh, or even call blitz. And then they can execute that move, get separation, and make a pass. Uh, if you have a, a, uh, another coach, right? You can go three on two drills. So myself and another assistant are the two. And then the three offensive players are driving and kicking, and we got to give them reads. Uh, if you don't have an assistant coach, which a lot of us don't at the grassroots, I, I, I sometimes don't. Imagine three players driving and kicking or running a ball screen or whatever, and then they make their move and they get to their place. Uh, the player that has the ball, can't make a decision until they get to the paint. Once they get to the paint, they got two offensive teammates who they can make a decision with. Before the guy gets to the paint, as a coach, I'm kicking it to one of his teammates. So now the ball is like your cover, your defender. So if that third teammate gets a pass from me, the second teammate is getting a pass from the point guard or the ball handler who's driving. Obviously, it'd be easier if we demonstrated it, but, you know, as a coach, you can manipulate decision-making with balls. So as a coach, you got two balls, one ball under your arm and another ball. 
or you can put one ball down, right, and just use one ball. And then once you execute that action, now you got, you know, two players, two on two on O. You pick up the other ball, and that player drives to the paint. And then if, if their player is open, he passes it. All right. If they're not open, he might shoot it or pass it to you because you just gave the ball to that second teammate. So uh, that's I, I, do, I was going to speak on that at the final four this year. I've done many final fours that I did that talk and, and it's well received. Uh, I have a lot of drills in my curriculum that have that. And uh, it, as a coach, it's fun. It's fun because you don't rest and, and you're you're engaged. The only negative about that, Chris, is that you can't jump in and intervene on, on, you know, skills. And sometimes you might miss some spacing because, you know, you're just trying to get the, the kids uh, reading reps. So the downside of that, the con of that drill is, man, you don't really see the intricate details of how uh, the kid wasn't in the right spot or he wasn't ready for the ball or didn't follow through or he wasn't keeping his head up on the drive, you know, things like that. But you do get great read reps. Great stuff. Uh, we'll keep firing these questions, Coach. So, uh, you know, let's, we got a lot of them in queue here, which is awesome. Uh, when you're building a skill de development plan for a player, how much do you guide what they need to work on versus their own aspiration? So basically what they want to work on versus what you feel they should work on? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's a, it, it's a different for me because I'm a business. So I'm a skill trainer. So if he's going to pay, man, you, you work on whatever you want, dog. You, you giving me some money, you know? No, I mean, seriously, uh, if he wants to work like Amari Stoudemire, you know, Amari Stoudemire hired me and he wanted to work on pick and pop. He wanted to work on mid post moves. He wanted to work on uh, creating off the dribble from the top of the key. His, so that's what we worked on. And it was all fundamental. I bought into it. Now, if I didn't buy into it, I wouldn't train them on that. So uh, I kind of educate players. If they're correct on, hey, I want to add this to my game, and I, and I agree with them, I'll train them. But if I don't agree, I'll educate them. I was like, look, man, this is not going to help you. So you got to trust me that here's what you really need. So as, as a, you're also, you, you know, you got to be a coach and not just a, a transactional service. You know, you, you're not, you're not Bruce, Chris, or McDonald's. You don't keep the customer happy you educate the customer and get and give them what they need not what they want but what they want they come to you and you say yeah I can work on that with you but then after you evaluate them you know from a professional you know business you give them what they need because you know you, you got to stay true to the game and then here's the trick you got to stay true to the coach so you know if I'm a high school coach or I'm a middle school coach you daggone right I'm gonna give the kid what I think he needs you know what I mean? He, he, you, no, this is my program. You need to work on what, what, you know, what, 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 what's going to help the team. Okay, you don't want to work on that? Well, you know, why? Why? You know, what's your goals? Well, I want to go to college. I want to go to the NBA. So as a coach, you know, you got to respect their opinion. You got to really be a, 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 a good uh, – you got to have a good buy-in. You got to be a good seller. You got to be a good motivator. You got to be a good innovator and, and get in and connect with them to get them on the same page you do. So uh, it's a fine balance of doing what's right for our program and then doing what's right to add to your game because all these kids want to play at the highest level and they want to make money and play professionally. I get it. So um, as a coach, you got to honor that. You got to respect that. And so work on, you know, what they need to work on for your team, but then give them extra time give them intel on what they want. Like everybody wants to handle the ball. Everybody wants to, you know, dribble and, and, and create James Harden highlights. Okay. Well, we'll do that in conjunction with your offensive system. Try to fit that in, you know, into some of your drills. Let them do a James Harden step back shot and then let them do a James Harden step back shot fake pass, cut to the rim, give and go. Like you got to – you know, you can't lead as, as coaches. You can't lead from your generation, right? You got to lead from their generation. If, if you don't meet these kids where they're at nowadays and be a little bit flexible and a little, little bit tolerant and not so communistic, right? If, if you do that, you're going to have a lot more fun. If you don't and, and, and you're hard and you're, and you're, 
you know, you're rigid and you're not open minded. You're going to have a lot of kids transfer. You're not going to have as much fun coaching. And it could affect your wins and loss, and it could affect your piece as a coach. So I hope, hope, hope I was clear in that. Yeah, good stuff. Let's, uh, let's keep it rolling here. Uh, in, in basically, in a one-hour session, what would be the best case for the number of things that you could focus on? This is from Coach Seth. Yeah, a one-hour session it really depends on the uh, uh, maturational Let's say high school player. Let's say high yeah. school. In a high school player, no more than two to three skills. Good stuff. Uh, Coach Anderson, uh, what does an ideal shooting release look like? I guess this is very general, but is there a perfect technique, Gannon? There's not a perfect technique, but, I mean, if you want to look at an ideal shot, J.J. Riddick, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, um go look at my curriculum I, I i show you how to shoot with both hands but two most important things for a shot are arc and alignment so alignment is are you square some people teach 10 toes to the rim some people teach a slant you know all correct some te people teach get you know one one foot one knee one hip um and then arc how do you get arc well you got to shoot it in one motion I don't care what it looks like. You can't have a two-piece shot where you get right here and you stop, a la Larry Bird. Well, Larry Bird was a great shooter. Okay, he was 6'9", and he shot a million shots. So, you know, Chris Mullen says you do two things. You learn the right way, and you shoot two, 300 a day, or you learn your way, and you shoot 1,000 to 2,000 a day. Either way, there's many ways to shooting success. And, you know, arc has a lot to do with driving your, your lower body through the ball and getting your elbow over your eye. I like to say elbow over your eye, ball to the sky. And then you got to, you know, you got to freeze your finish. Dave Hopla, you got to freeze your finish and hold your release. So, you know, that's the, that's, that's the ideal formula for a shot. But uh, there's nothing wrong with going to watch Clay Thompson shoot and teaching kids how to mimic him. Absolutely. I've, I've given that advice a lot. Good stuff. Um, coach, I know you kind of addressed this. Coach Kellen asked about what advice you have to teams or individuals that have had their league canceled or practice canceled during this time, and then how would you continue to serve them? We talked about this at the beginning. Are you okay if I give out your email so they can email you about your document yeah. that you produced? Okay. Yeah, please, please email me, um, Gannon. I just, yeah, I just posted it yes. in the chat, so it's even. I'll, I'll I'll send you the document, but you know. Real quickly, yep. you know, I wrote down players have to be practical. You know, coaches, you'll have to educate, empower, emphasize to these players uh, some of these things to do. But the players have to have a self-will and a self-discipline to now, you know, uh, attack time and, not, and not, not be a time stealer. You know, there's many time stealers and distractions or threats during the day. So, you know, not in any particular order, but I, I – I, you know, I would tell my players, you know, every, every day, like five days a week, every day, no matter how long it takes. And it won't take more than four or five hours, which, you know, you could set it up as a school. You know, you're doing this subject, this subject. But the first subject, you know, is, is you know, mental. Look up podcasts. Look up TED Talks. You know, get books on character traits that interest that player. And specifically, in my experience, even NBA, WNBA, Players uh, struggle with stress, anxiety, confidence, and then you got the the you know the guys on the team that are trying to lead, but nobody listens to them. Uh, they deal with connect they deal with connection problems to their teammates, uh, and they deal with pressure. So, and then they need to do research on if any of these threats have threatened their game. They need to research it. Number two, easy one, you know, watch film, um, soak up and ingest all the offense and defensive concepts that their coach is asking them to be responsible for. Uh, break down their film into positive and negative trends, traits, strengths, and weaknesses on both ends. And, you know, a good, if they don't know, then, you know, the truth fears no question. If you're all about the truth and making your game the best you can be, 
you need to have a sit down and a Q&A with, with your coach and ask the right questions. If you want the right answers, you have to ask the right questions. Um, they need to go over these edits with their teammates in a group session like this. This is awesome. It's, it's amazing. The tech. If this happened when I went to high school in 88 and 89, I mean, we'd be on the telephone. And I would, ha I would have to dial, like, it'd take me an hour. It'd take me about uh, uh, 30, 40 minutes to dial somebody because when you dial the phone, it comes back, right? Remember that? So, um, it, you know, it's stuff like, I mean, I, I got tons of stuff. Physically, well, coach, coach, let's have them email you for the document. We, we don't need to go through all of it because there's yeah, a lot but, of other questions. Like physically, the best thing is to go outside on an outdoor court and work out by yourself. But yeah, I'll send, I got over a hundred things. So I'll send it, I'll send it to people if they want. Great document. I have a chance to look at it. It's wonderful. I'll give you lots of ideas and stimulate your thinking uh, for all you to do as coach. And, uh, coach Chad gave you a shout out in here just talking about your curriculum and how amazing it is well so coach chad thanks for that yeah. um next one what specific terminology and this is a general question so coaches try and make them a little bit more specific maybe just to get your answers like uh what specific terminology do you use when teaching appropriate ball handling fundamentals so let's give maybe two to three three to four key words that you use to emphasize ball handling when you teach it so maybe that's the way to approach it yeah the terminology of, of ball handling to me is like stationary Right, ball handling, you're doing kind of non-game like drills, you know, dribbling is station so I would say for ball handling, you know, you're doing ball wraps and different stuff, you know, keep your head up, keep the ball close to your body, right? And and maximize the movement. Now when you're doing stationary dribbling, right? Number one, drop your hips, get low so you can go. Number two, get your elbow through the ball, dribble hard, they can't guard. And number number three, you know, keep your head up so you see a play ahead. Um, and then when you make when you make uh, moves, you know, maximize movement, uh, minimize energy, okay? Because a lot of times you can do more with less. A lot of players, you know, move, do a crossover and they move their whole body. Therefore, they're not enhancing their athleticism, or uh, they're not saving energy. So uh, when you dribble the ball, you want to really spread your fingers out. And keep the ball out of your palm and let your hands absorb the ball when you're passing the ball you know get the ball in tight load your elbow and then go lock your elbow you know it's amazing you you pass with the same release you shoot with the same release and you dribble with the same release it's elbow in elbow lock so i call it the universal release if you can get kids to do that they're going to be a more consistent dribbler passer shooter uh, Coach Noonan uh, says that he has a player, uh, former Division One player, that's going overseas. Are there three to five pieces of advice you would give him for developing his game to translate to the international game? I got to think shooting's number one. All shooting. Yeah. It, well, and, and then first, make sure that the culture of the player of the place he's going to is legitimate. Make there's make sure there's integrity, make sure there's character, make sure his agent is looking out for him. So that's good. That's the first because everything I'm about to say is, is meaningless. Uh, but shooting. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have to, you have to score. You're going to have to score and or play make. So I hope you're versatile unless you're a big seven footer and they just want you to roll and rebound. But you know, most players, most Americans that I've seen over there that I've trained, uh, I'm going to have a kid, you know, come here, see me in April. Uh, we got to make them versatile. You know, they got to be able to play with the catch, play play with the bounce, uh, play off the ball. So you got to be able to get to your shot anytime you want, Spe especially late late shot clock. Um, and make decisions, man. You know, the game is fast. These guys are quick. The, the sets, Chris, you know this, man, the sets are intricate. Uh, they'll draw up stuff and timeouts, and you got to go execute right away could be in a different broken language. So your presence and your, you know, aptitude for the game, you know, has to be there, man. It has to be on. And the last one, man, be in great shape. Because you get over there and not in good shape, you're injured. Now this ain't the NBA. They will just send you home and get somebody else. So you gotta be in great shape mentally and physically. I'll add one more. Just be open to the experience. 
because it's yeah. going to be different. And I think too many American players go over there thinking it's going to be like their college experience or like the NBA, and it's not. It's a life experience, and it's tremendous if you're open. Yeah, so, Chris, which leads me to if you're working out a kid that's going overseas, it's not just on-court training. No. You know, talk to the kid about life, culture, everything we, you and I just talked about outside of basketball, during stretching, after the workout, when you break bread. One of the things I love about my job is a lot of these kids can live with me. I'm blessed to have extra room. And, you know, he becomes my little brother for, you know, a month, two months. And we talk a lot about life and, and the experience and the, and the, and the uh, inclusiveness, right, that you're talking about with other cultures. So that's a great point. Uh how do you best incorporate free play into your workouts or practices? By that, I think they mean giving the kids an opportunity to be able to play, pick up, play freely, something like that in terms of your workouts. Like, is it all structured? I mean, you only have them a short time, two times, but do you still give them some free play opportunity? I mean, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, we, you know, with one kid, Right. With one kid, free play is all right. Today, it's your workout. You know what drills we want to do, uh, but you pick them. You, you, you pick what we want to work on. Like that's an example of free play. Um, a lot of these kids love to play one on one with me. So at the end of the workout, when I say in after an hour workout, I guess the last 10 minutes, I'll play them one on one. That's fun for me. And then while we play them one on one, I'm giving them coaching like I'm coaching him on the fly in live time hey stop you should have done this where was my hands hey when i did this move you should have been here let's go watch your body language you just cursed you know that's not going to help you let's go so uh when you got you know uh two kids free play is letting them play more one-on-one -on -one or letting them choose the drill and then when you got three kids or four kids it's two on two that's my definition of free play great stuff uh coach spencer i think i'll do one of these uh, myself next week or so. And if you ask that same question, I'll be able to give you some ideas from a team perspective about how to incorporate that. I'm big on that as well, what Dan was saying. So, um, I'll give you, I'll give you something Manu Ginobili told me. Uh, I spent yeah. four days with him in China. He said Pop would do a lot of that. Like he'll come to practice and he'll be like, all right, guys, we got an hour. It's your show. And he would just sit on the side with a cup of coffee. Now he was in a watchtower, right? He'd jump in. Uh, I spent a week with uh, Memphis. Penny Hardaway did a lot of that. You know, their coaches would just stand back, and and that that brings leadership. That's a leadership drill. You know, that 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 brings your team together. That's a team building skill. Where you know, and and you see who's paying attention and who was. Great stuff, uh, Coach. Uh, the next one is basically around what type of decisions are you teaching off the ball or sorry, off a of ball screen. Off a of ball it, screen? Yeah, off a of ball screen. So is it always based on how a team might defend you? Uh, well, I think I understand that question. I mean, as, as a coach, you know, at, at, see, as a, as a team coach, you know, what do teams, you know, what do the top five teams in your league do defensively? You know, you got to know the trends of the top teams, and, and that's what you drill on. Right. What, what are you weak at uh, as an offensive team versus ball screen coverage? That's what you that's what you work on as a private skill trainer, man. I got to know, know it all. So I'm teaching the ball handler. Right. Your defender is going to get on. You want your defender to get on your hip and, and you know, cover you over the screen. But if he doesn't, he's either going to switch or he's going to go under. And so you give him the solutions for that. If, if you're guarding the you know, if the screener screener's defender that's guarding the screener well i mean you got to have a solution for a hard show you know you got to have a solution for a soft show you got to have a solution for a separated show you got to have a solution for a jam you got to have a solution for an ice you got to have a solution for a blitz and you got to have a solution for a switch i think and there might be more that that's that's all i teach if anybody's got any other ball screen defensive coverages um and so you just teach solutions for that in a one on o, two on o, three on o uh, structure, and, and then obviously you can use a chair as the screener, and you just and you teach decisions. So as a coach, you're in there guarding them. You know, if you don't guard them, you have other players guard them. So it, it can be done, and that that's a lot of NBA 
player development coaches, that's what they do from their different angles, you know, side pick and roll, baseline pick and roll, top, elbows, you know, high, drags. That's what they do. It's a complex answer. And, you know, there because there's the skill, there's the decision, and then you've got to put them together. And, uh, th you know, that's a challenge if you're working one on oh versus you have a group workout or you have a team practice. Very different yeah. answer in all those things. So, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Um, Coach Hopkins, we'll get to your question a little bit at the end, just asking more of information about your curriculum and stuff. We'll talk about that at the end. But I encourage you, I put links in throughout, including one uh, just below, which is uh, in uh, again, bakerbasketball.com slash basketball dash curriculum. So I'll repost that for everyone, but go check that out. That's more information. And then Gannon's email is here as well, so you can reach out to him. But we'll come back to that a little bit, talking about the mentorship uh, model as well, which is something that Gannon has done a great job of. So, um, Coach Hayden, uh, I would be interested in what you teach about the runner. Do you stress a part of the floor? What technique are you teaching? Um, go yeah, ahead. I would. I would say, you know, go to my YouTube website, curriculum. You can get more specifics there. But, you know, I, I would say the first thing I do is, is do it stationary slow. You know, real up close, knee to the chest, high jump, not long jump. Don't break the wrist. Get the ball as high as the backboard. But any skill you teach, you do it form, right? Then you do game speed, and then you do it with some kind of decision or – you know, flesh against defense. And that's that's how I teach any skill. But the runner is hard. So you got to, you know, just like shooting, you teach, you, you give them the form with no ball and then you let them do it right under the rim and then you just kind of move back. Angles, just like driving. You got a runner from the corner. You got a runner from the wing of 45. You got a runner from the elbows. The top. It's great. I mean, I love it. It's, it's a great – I mean, again, we got to be flexible. If if a kid, listen, if a, if your kid wants to work on his game and he wants to be coachable, you know, let him do it. I mean, why why turn? Why say no? You can't do that move if he's going to sacrifice and earn the right to do that move. Now, my my high school assistant said, Gannon, you can throw behind the back passes all you want. I just want to see you doing it every day. I want to see you working on it because if you work on it, the repetition is the mother of success. In the game, it's going to be instinct. Yeah, you can shoot threes, but not right now. Go out and shoot a million, then come back and see me. Like, that's – as coaches, that's how we respond to that. We don't say no. We just teach them, okay, you want to get to that level? Well, here's how. Because right now, no. Next year, it might be a go. But in between the no and the go, you got to get a lot of reps. You feel me, you know? Yeah, that's great. Coach Josh, love this question. Gannon, what things have you become more – flexible with and not so rigid over time oh great great point um heck man i don't know if anybody's ever asked me that come to mind pivot feet pivot feet i've, I've always been a guy um off off down screens inside foot right inside foot um but now i teach the the jump stop you know almost jj riddick ray allen Right, TJ McConnell come off. So I, I've been a permanent pivot foot guy. John Lucas was one of my mentors, and he's like that. But now I'm not. I mean, you know, I think we need to teach kids off how to pivot off both feet. You know, catch it, jump, stop, pivot off right, pivot off left, inside pivot, outside pivot. So pivot foot is one. Um, instead of teaching, hey, you only get two dribbles, you only get three dribbles, and then you got to make a play. No, I was, that's just, to me, that's wrong teaching. It's, hey, you got to make a play in two seconds. You got to make a play. So let the kid dribble as many times as he wants, but he's got to get separation in two or three seconds. Um, shot selection, you know, during workouts, I, 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 I've been a huge believer recently in, hey, if you're open, shoot. Where before, Even when I was coaching in college, you know, all three coaches that I worked under was like, hey, you know, I know you're open, but let's keep working for a better shot. Even, you know, back then, if they were open early shot clock, we wouldn't shoot it sometimes just to get more foul troubles under guys, to work the guys. And, you know, to me, shot selection is something that I'm, I've gotten a little bit more flexible on, just to name a few. Yeah, that's good stuff. 
Uh, Coach Derek, uh, during team practices, what is one or, or what are one or two things you emphasize daily? So let's apply this to your workouts. What are one or two things you apply daily? Yeah, well, you know, I work out a lot of teams where I'll go and do a camp with 80 kids or I'll go work out uh, a, a college. I'm going to work out Indiana State's women's program in June. Uh, I did a lot of Nike AAU teams for 15 years. So I, I, have, I have tremendous experience working out teams. And it, and it would be like three, four, seven days so I could build culture. But here are my non-negotiables, right, with teams. Number one, you got to talk, right? You can't be silent. So you celebrate each other, but you also hold each other accountable, right? But you can't be silent. Hey, if you like something I did as a coach, let's build a relationship, man. You know, fill my bucket. My love, love language is words of affirmation. Personally, the more you tell me I'm, 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 you like that, I'm doing good, the better I'm going to be. You know, quite honestly, that, that helps me. So talk to me. Coach, I like that. Thank you. Boom. Let's have a relationship so you can't be silent. Number two, man, we're going, there's no dead time. There's no rest time. You can get water on your own, but we're not having water breaks. I got an hour and a half, two hours. Man, we're going. Um, when you're waiting in line, right, every kid has a ball at, at these workouts, unless we're playing cutthroat or five-on-five, three-on-three-on-three. Three on three on three. We're doing skill work. Even in one-on-one, -on -one, you have your ball, so you're working on your shot. You're working on your jabs. Like, we're going hard. You can't be soft can't be soft is when you face face adversity body language like i'm big into camouflage and weakness don't yawn right eyes on the coach acknowledge it be excited show your emotions if you face frustration uh fear chaos pain don't show it is it real yes but don't show it because it empowers the competition and the last one is selfish. Don't be selfish. So any selfish behavior, that's my not, I'm, I'm checking it. I'm, I'm, I'm intruding. I'm, um, I'm responding to that, right? I'm emphasizing that. Don't be soft. Don't be silent. Don't be selfish. Winning teams talk and touch. So that's part of being unselfish. High five everybody. It's amazing the champions I've been around, Steve Nash, uh, the Minnesota Lynx, right? Just to name a few. Uh, I had a chance to watch Steve Nash a lot training Amari Stoudemire. Actually, had to, was able to train the Minnesota Leafs during the offseason for three months. It's amazing the talking and touching that go Diana Taurasi. Right? Just the great ones are selfless. So those are my those are my non-negotiables as as teams. And then you fill in the skill skill stuff is not important. If they don't have that non you know silent selfish soft, you're done. You know it's 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 wasted work. Uh, Coach Robinson, I believe, uh, in a weekly camp, which you just talked about that you do, is it better to work on everything or to be, I assume what he's saying is more specific, in your opinion, to certain skills or concepts? Yeah, great question. Uh, we always do a survey. I mean, obviously, if you get kids signed up before, we do a survey and just ask the kids, what do you want to work on? Because you can't, and even in a week, man, you can't, it's like coaching, you can't work on everything. So... As a coach, you do research or maybe you have enough experience. What are the most important things these kids need? And we talked about some of the important skills today. And then ask them, hey, you're paying to come to my camp or, you know, you're, you're going to put time into this camp. What do you want to work on? Like that, that, that's, that's, the, that's a great coaching technique. Ask your players, hey, what do you think? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, what do you want to work on, man? It's, you know, you're, you're just the GPS. They're the car. <laughs> Car's more powerful than GPS because eventually they don't need a GPS, right? The, the, the biggest thing, the biggest compliment a, a student can give a teacher is, hey, coach, I got that. Thank you. What's the next step? Right? That's, you're just trying to get the kid to the next step. And then eventually you're Phil Jackson on the bench. They don't, they don't need you. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, so let's fire off a few and uh, let's try and get these quick, but Coach Allen asked about your experience in China and how Chinese coaches are coming along, uh, particularly let's focus on with your training. It's hard. It's, it's yeah. the hardest project I've ever had to do in my life. Um, I mean, everything you read in China about the government and the politicalness and the communism and the systematic and, I mean, it's in basketball. It's, it's, uh, it's making me better 
I don't know if I'm making a difference, but uh, I know I'm changing a few lives. Uh, it's hard. It's hard because they don't have they don't have the foundation. Uh, they're top level. They're Olympics and pros. They don't they don't really do it the right way. Um, I, I, I go over there. My, my first statement is thank you. Thanks for having me. How many of you guys want to be great coaches and teachers and players? Boom. How many of you guys want to be as good as the NBA in Europe? They raise, they raise – I said, well, you all got to do what we do. This is how Western Europe and NBA, WNBA, America – this is how America approaches the game. This is what you need to do. So do exactly as I'm doing, as I'm saying, as I wrote it down, as you're seeing, and you'll be fine. And they sit there and shake their head, and then they go out and do something totally different. Because I get to see, I get to see, you know, curriculum one. Curric I, I get to see these coaches over three years. So I get the same. We have about three thousand in our program right now, I, and they pay, and, and they 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 come for three years. It's like a real class, and there's no retention. <laughs> I reteach it because it's habits. It's it's the spirit of China, which is very hard. Anybody that's coached over there would know that. But it's making me better. I, I'm fired up. It's a challenge. So. Let's go. I'm not going to okay. complain. I'm going to compete, right? So yeah, we know you're ready for a challenge, Coach. You're always ready for a challenge. We know that. So, <laughs> Coach Hellstrom, uh, Brandon, great question. Uh, skill development, would you prefer a group workout or individual workout? You guys, your choice. Me, I, I like I like anybody that's passionate. Um, but, it, you know, I, I, would, I would say group because I've done a ton of – I've been doing this thing 20 years, and I love groups now. Because now you can teach them the game, Chris. You can teach them the game. It's not the narcissistic, hey, you look good on Instagram. That's good, coach. Uh, that's good. I taught you that. But, hey, can you can you apply that to the game? Like, I taught a lot of players moves for years. But, man, did, I, did, I, did, they, did they go apply it to the game? They got to play with four other players. So, right now, um, you know, I would say my choice would be teaching players two-on-o, three-on-o, three-on-three-on-three. Right, the big three, Ice Cube. He's a genius. It's it's great. It's fun for coaches to teach the part and then put it into hold. Uh, so what are your thoughts? Okay, let me read this. What are your thoughts on the differences and similarities of a trainer and a coach? Okay, I get that. So, I guess what are the differences between a trainer and a coach? Uh, that's a good question. You know, a trainer teaches players concepts and drills. Uh, you know, it's more of a, of a, of a taskmaster. A coach teaches them how to use their mind as well as their body. And I think a, a coach is more valuable than a trainer because a basketball coach can teach them how to apply everything to the game in life. A trainer just teaches them uh, movements. So uh, for me, when I first got into industry, I used the term trainer because in, in business, everybody understood fitness trainer and, you know, a uh, uh, dog trainer. So it was a common theme. And then as I gained respect, I changed my title to player development and coach because that's who I was. The first job out of college for me was a NCAA coach, Division One and Two. So I always look at myself as a coach, and, and I think a coach can hit the holistic part of what a player needs, where a trainer can only hit the physical, you know, do this, do that, do that, do that, which is fine. Where, wherever you're going to be, just own it. That, that's all. I, for our industry of skilled trainers and coaches that do this, just own it. If, you, if you're a trainer, then own it. If you're Instagram celebrity, direct message NBA guys, and – try to get followers, that's fine. Then just own it. But don't uh, confuse parents and programs because, you know, a, a coach is powerful. A trainer can be powerful, but just just be clear in who you are and what you do. Yeah, I would there's agree. A, there's a lot of ambiguity in our industry with that. Uh, yeah, it's semantics. I mean, th th there's, there's trainers who coach and then there's coaches who train. So uh, I, I would say by and large, I would – general generally give a definition and say that coaches are stopping and correcting and that's what good trainers do they stop and they correct a trainer who is not correcting anything and just putting you through a workout that would be sort of what 
we're talking about in terms of just someone that's putting you in a work, right? Whereas trainers and coaches trainer. stop and coach and correct. That's, that's what you're looking for. That's what makes a difference. Yeah, I call it intervention. Intervention. You gotta and give feedback. Coaching and not, just a yeah. trainer. Can't learn without feedback. Uh, yeah. Just two quick ones here. Do you make any adjustments when you teach outside of the U.S.? And I'm imagining you're getting into this just now, the new FIBA travel rule. Um, you know, <laughs> it, you know, for coaches that don't know it, it's it's basically, well, I can't even explain it. You'd have to go look at it, but look it up. FIBA, you get an extra FIBA step. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you get, you know, zero, one, two, whatever it's called. But yeah. um, how much do you adjust when you teach internationally? Because the rules are different. Um, I only adjust on the lane, like, you know, the trapezoid lane. So different angles and different spots um, where people catch the ball. You got to put that into your curriculum. And then uh, the open step, you know, when you catch the ball and you if you're going left, right, you might step with your left foot. You catch the ball, you go right. You might step with the right foot, but it's, an, it's called an open step. Like in, in, in FIBA, that's a walk. So you, you can't you got to put the ball down first. Where in the States, feet first, ball second. In, in Europe, it's ball first, feet second. So that, that's, you know, and then the physical play, you know, you're a little more physical in your workouts and you let things go a little bit more. That, that's, that's, but it's not, not much. That's the only adjustments I make. Yeah, and I find players can adjust generally to those rules. And you're finding a lot more of that uh, throw down or stab dribble is what I call it, uh, appearing in the North American game now anyways. Uh, yeah. because it's effective so uh coach josh with the last question when you encounter a player that doesn't bring the passion to the workout what do you do <laughs> oh man i go off because that that's my standard that that's that's the i would say the best thing that i demonstrate is you know you walk in that gym man it, it's on I, i'm uh i address it <laughs> i address it I, I address it with a loud tone i, I break i try to break that Pat, you know, passive spirit, but but I don't try to break his heart. Uh, might throw a punishment in there. Uh, might kick him out and say, "Come back tomorrow." And if he eventually doesn't buy in, he doesn't deserve my time. Like I'm, I'm in a position to do that. I, I, I can't tell you what you should do as a coach, but um, you know, every kid doesn't deserve your time. You, you love every kid, you respect every kid, but every kid doesn't deserve your time. Like, you know, we can't save them all. And so if that one kid is just so stubborn, then focus on the other 10 or 11 or whatever. But I, I've never had a problem with that. I, I know how to deal with that. that. That's not a problem for me. Uh, well, if they're, not, if they're not passionate, then they're out, you know. Yeah, and it's hard not to be passionate around you. And I think that's the other part. It's You're infectious, right? You're the yeah. right type of uh, right type of infection. And, and that might to bring enthusiasm to them. And that's a great point. Maybe the coach uh, has to check his passion. Maybe he's not creating an environment of fun. Maybe he needs to do some things to create some excitement. Maybe add time and score and music and ask more. Hey, what do you want to work on? Be more uh, inclusive with the player. You know what I mean? That might be your fault. Such a great point. And really, generally for coaches, I just say, don't always be the same because they get used to it. If you are changing up your energies, your your passion, you're stoic, and then you're fired yeah. up when you need to be, then that that can help you know inspire and change. Yeah, I call it the law of familiarity, right? When things become familiar, change up your terminology, change up your environment, change up something, but keep it fresh. Brilliant. Yeah, great point. Great point. Brilliant, Coach Gannon. Uh, cannot thank you enough. Uh, I've already posted all the links and your email. So coaches don't hesitate, reach out. Uh, Gannon is a giver. He's a sharer. And you've heard that on the podcast. You've heard that today as well. Um, go check out his uh, mentorship program and coach just quickly. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Right. You know, we have, we have many levels of our mentorship program. And again, there are many great mentors out there. Chris uh, obviously is one. Uh, I do what I do. So just email me, contact me on social media. Uh, we have a Zoom call like this once a month, uh, and we, we talk about things from life to basketball, same kind of setup. Uh, we have a free mentorship with, you get emails and content. Just go on my website, it's real self-explanatory. And then, you know, if you wanna invest, we have a private mentorship where you can come see me. 
I mean, you could use it as a vacation. I live 500 yards from the beach. I have a hot tub and a pool, a uh, little outdoor court. You could come vacation with some beach and then get some basketball too. I cook for you. Uh, but there is a cost for that. But that's a private mentorship. And then, uh, you know, I travel all over the world. Uh, if, if you want to come to an event and watch and then get a cup of coffee afterwards, that's a sort of mentorship. And, and Chris, I just want to be clear. The, the, one of the reasons I like the mentorship is because I learn. I mean, I learned a few things today that uh, I, I haven't, you know, heard of before so or been asked questions. So it's, it's a more of a keeping me engaged and keeping me uh, open and not stale as well. And it, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, we have tons of people on this con uh, on this call and, and people always say, well, nobody wants to learn anymore. You know, I'm not getting a lot out of the game. Well, what are you putting into it? You yeah. know, if you're stuck, it's because you're not sewing, you know, if you want education, you got to sow time, you got to sow education and then you reap the benefits. So it's all, it's all about, you know, selfishly I'm doing this cause I'm getting a lot more in return. But I'm easy to get a hold of, man. I would love to hear from you. I have some great notes from today that I could send you about, you know, how to be victorious in this virus. So hit me up. Love it. Love it. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time we do a live hangout. Um, we'll try and make this more regular because, as Gan said, this is a time for all of us to keep learning and uh, we'll take advantage. Chris, you do a great job, man. You're a genius. Thank you, man. Thanks, bud. We'll talk to you. Take care, everyone. All right.